Welcome back, everyone, to the Cube here in our Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, with Dave Vellante, my co-host for the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Program, part of the Cube Plus NYSE Leadership Series with the Wired Program. Larry Yang, the Chief Product of Phenonic, is here. Solid State Cooling Category Leader and Builder. Larry, thanks for coming on the Cube. Thanks, great, great being on here. So obviously power and cooling has been the biggest topic since there's been microprocessors because they get heating up. Um, you guys are in this business, you got a little prop for us there. Before we get into what you got show and tell, um, talk about what you guys do because you guys are doing some really cool things around making it the better planet, one. Two, making things work efficiently. Yeah, so at Phenonic we build solid state cooling solutions that cool everything from the lasers on the end of fiber optic cables that are beaming the bits for this video stream to online grocery order refrigerator totes. When you order your pint of ice cream, our technology keeps that frozen. We also keep uh, air conditioning, uh, we generate air conditioning and heating for 100,000 square foot office buildings. So you're making, you're making some devices and chips mm -hmm. to really make it better. Solid state, we all know that from our PCs, like a oh, solid state memory is good, sure. not as good as RAM, but like close enough, better than spinning disk. Similar concept here. Can you show us what you guys have here and yeah. take us through yeah. some Talk of the, the yeah. swarm factors, because this is compelling innovation. Yeah. So we started making these smaller chips here. So they, it, we use a, solid, uh, a thermoelectric material where if you apply an electric current, one side gets hot, the other side gets cold. Think of it as like a mini heat pump, if you will. We built these smaller ones. Uh, we've shipped over 20 million of these to keep the lasers and optical transceivers cool. As data rates have gotten higher and higher, the lasers get pushed uh, harder and harder. So to keep them more efficient, we, uh, we, they, the, our customers put these on the lasers, keep them cool, keep the, keep the bit rates flowing. Our engineers then figure out how to make these bigger and bigger ones. Um, then they figure out how to array them into, into, into a module and encapsulate this. And this, this, this form factor here now can, uh, can be a freezer. We actually have deployed thousands of refrigerator and freezer totes for online yeah. grocery operations. So when you order your ice cream or your frozen pizza, yeah. stays cool uh, before uh, before you pick it up. It's like Moore's Law for cooling. I mean, you're making it bigger, better, and smaller, faster, cheaper. But this is important because form factor becomes huge. Right. Like right. the refrigeration, that's like a core problem people can think. Why do I want right. to have to cool all this space for one carton or right. whatever? That's exactly right. Your typical online grocery operation today has giant refrigerator reach-ins and freezer reach-ins. If all you have is a pint of ice cream to, to keep frozen, they still have to run all of those big reach-ins 24 seven. And so how does this apply to our world, which is you know, data centers and AI and, and infrastructure? Yeah, so in the data center world, we are already selling into these optical transceivers. Our customers are qualified in every major US hyperscaler, you know, think Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Google and they are seeing um, cooling challenges as well. 40% of the cost of a data center today is in thermal management. Uh, the cooling of racks is a $4 billion business today and is growing to 14 billion in, in, in about five years. Everyone thinks about getting the electricity into the data center to the chips. Not enough people are talking about what happens when that electricity gets to the chip, turns into heat, now you got to get the heat away from the chip, out the rack, and eventually out the building. And that's where we come so in. When I started in the industry, liquid cooling, you know, with mainframes, that was, was how you took heat out. Mm -hmm. um, what will this do? Well, and you see it coming back now, you're seeing all these hoses now going into supercomputers and, mm -hmm. and, and AI you know, servers. What will this do? Will it lessen sort of the, the need? It'll make those, that infrastructure more efficient? It'll make that infrastructure uh, more efficient. So our technology is compatible. If you already have an air-cooled solution today, you can keep uh, using that. If you've already moved to liquid cooling, or maybe if you're not ready to move to liquid cooling, we can we can uh, super supercharge your liquid cooling as well. So you're going to elongate the life of your air-cooled. Yes, I presume that's one of the value props. Right. Right. And then right. just just make the li the liquid cooling more effective. How do I deploy this technology? So we our customers are the uh, cooling subsystem uh, companies, if you will, the people building the, the heat sinks and the heat pipes and the, and the, and the liquid uh, coal plates, et cetera. So we're working with them to supercharge their, their solution, if you will, to get their solution to be more efficient. So they put this capability, these chips directly into their solution. Right, right, right. right. And then that ultimately goes yeah. into a data center. So like a switch ASIC today generates 500 watts of heat and it's no bigger, it's a little bit bigger than the size of a quarter. That's 10 times the heat density than a clothing iron. 
So that thing touch. gets very, very hot. Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe iron your clothes. Maybe it's a little too hot even for that. Yeah, and then the th obviously heat causes problems, breakage, fault tolerance, you know, things break. And so this helps there reliability. Big, exactly. There's two big. One is exactly that reliability. The other is a throttling problem. So when a, when a GPU or CPU gets too hot, it actually has to slow down and takes longer to get the workload or the task uh, completed. With our right. technology, we get more of the heat out so that the, the, the task can finish more and more quickly. I love the cube because we can talk about things like that get so nerdy, like GPU to GPU connectivity, that's what NVIDIA talks about. Uh -huh. But what they don't talk about is when those connections don't work. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Stuff happens. Right. When you have this, to slow and this down. is real. Yeah. I mean, and this is these interconnects are a big part of that. So that's part of the data center. Right. AI is a big market for you. Right. You also do automotive. And right. With cars, you have um, big customers there, LiDAR, yeah. they have connections. Yeah. So Those are I, I like to gate. joke, anywhere there's a laser, we can cool it. So um, we do have LiDAR customers and they have to keep their lasers cooled. I was joking with you earlier, <laughs> we, we actually have customer building a super collider and they have lasers there and we've actually sold into that application <laughs> as well. It's fun, must be, you must love your job because who doesn't like fun. lasers? Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. Larry, you have some stats on your website. Mm -hmm. um, one in particular that caught my attention around uh, heat density. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if I'm reading this correctly, you can, you can increase heat density by more than 50% uh, relative to a typical sort of, sort of performance. Can you explain the concept of heat density and how you affect that and why it's important in the data center? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a switch ASIC generates the, it, it's, it's 10 times the heat density than, uh, than, a, than a clothing iron. And so it's all the more important to add that additional heat pumping capability, if you will, so that it's truly active. People, when people talk about active, they talk about fans mm -hmm. and water pumps. Um, for us, active is actually moving the heat molecules or, 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 or particles, if you will, um, using the thermoelectric uh, property. So that is what boosts, if you will, the heat pumping and capability and the ability to handle higher heat density. That's awesome. And you guys have other solutions. I want to get into the HVAC. Mm -hmm. so I think that's a really big area that hits a lot of people. Yep. Sustainability hits the better planet kind of initiative. But you have um, a concept that you guys talk about called cold chain, uh, like a supply chain concept. This is kind of real life. Take us through what a cold chain is, why, what is, what is a cold chain? Sure. Obviously refrigeration, you mentioned, you know, the last miles in there, you got these people, we all experience DoorDash and Uber Eats and there's a lot of yeah. things going on. So what is a cold chain? Why is it important? Yeah, so cold chain is in the context of grocery fulfillment is the entire life of your food, right? Your, your lettuce, your frozen peas, your ice cream, uh, your fish, all of that has to be kept at temperature and um, there's a vast industry, if you will, all the way from <laughs> large warehouses yeah. to fulfillment centers to the actual retail store to the last mile mm -hmm. when the DoorDash person shows up, uh, shows, shows up at, your, at your door. The online grocery business is about a $200 billion a year business. Um, it certainly had, had, had a good bump during COVID, but a lot of consumers' habits have not changed. Right, they've, they've discovered the convenience of that and the flexibility of that. And grocers have now adapted to that and they had now, now recognized the power of e-commerce, if you will. So your innovation operation. allows them to change form factor too. It's not general purpose. That's right. We all seen the trucks driving around. It's a fish truck, obviously refrigeration is needed. That's right. What's in there? So yeah, <laughs> no, your typical online grocery operation, um, sort of old school is you place your order. Some guy goes out onto the store floor, grabs your milk from the refrigerator section, runs over to the frozen section, grabs your ice cream, goes to the back room, and there's an entire duplicate set of reach-in freezers and refrigerators. Put your milk back in there, put your ice cream back in there, and then when you show up, the guy has to do, touch your product one more time. Grab your milk out of the fridge, grab your ice cream yeah. out, of, out of the freezer. Yeah. Our product eliminates all that because they can now take a tote out onto the store floor, put your ice cream directly in that tote, park it in the back, and then when you show up, bring the tote out to your car, yeah. unload it. Oh, Cuts yeah. the seven, yeah. eight, 10 minute wait time that you normally have down to like two minutes or even. And then you're seeing a lot of these ghost kind of factories where robotics is involved. That's, that's coming too. This is where you yep. start to see automation yep. coming. There, there are a number of, they call them micro fulfillment centers. Okay. Some of them are automated. Some of them, are, some of them are, are also manual, kind of a dark store. You place your order and that's actually where the order gets handled. Plus you have a, 
a flexible footprint. If you have to reconfigure your, your warehouse or your facility, you can do that with this technology. That's right. As opposed to you know, much larger refrigerators, you can still reconfigure that, but it's much more time consuming. We, we have a grocer uh, at uh, their, their store, is called ShopRite. They have a store up in Fishkill where we've yeah. deployed their operation. They've said there's a 50% uh, space savings. They can now free up yeah. that space to do other things. For yeah, their, for their more store. product to sell, better more use of it. Sell, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. tell about the HVAC side because that's the other area you guys are innovating on. You guys are shipping a lot of components. Can you share some of the numbers just in general? And then HVAC we all can relate to when it's hot. The AC's going on, and then that's that's also drawing a lot of power too. Yeah. And heat. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, we have a hundred thousand square foot office building over in Paris, where nine hundred of these modules are now deployed providing uh, air conditioning as well as, uh, as well as heating. As I mentioned, a thermoelectric property, you apply electric current, mm -hmm. one side gets hot, the other side gets cold, you reverse it, the other side now gets hot, the other side gets cold. So the same unit yeah. can be used for both heating. So how do you deploy that? Take us through the deployment. Is it in a device? Is it in the air conditioner? I mean, take us through. Yeah. Is it part of the... So, so there's a, imagine there's like a larger version of the, of, the, yeah. of the module I just showed here. There's three of those in a, uh, in a unit about the size of two by three of ceiling tiles, if you will, mm -hmm. sits up in the, in the ceiling. And in the overall building, what typically happens is there's a giant rooftop chiller, chills your air all the way down, pipes it to every room, yep. whether it needs it or not. Some rooms get better than others, and Some we all get there. better. <laughs> right. So with our solution, the rooftop chiller is now smaller, the air is partially chilled, and only the rooms that, have our, that, that need it, yeah. uh, all the rooms have our system, only the rooms that need it then get chilled the rest of the way. So the overall electric footprint is yeah. reduced, and more importantly, the hydrofluorocarbon footprint is yeah. eliminated. Ba great efficiency there. I'm sure Vegas hotels would love this. Mm -hmm. This is probably a growth area for you. You see this, yeah. this big part? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have a number of installations going yeah. on in the United States yeah. right now. That's smart. How do you manufacture these devices? Let's explain that. So we have a factory in Thailand that, uh, that we operate. There's a, there's a company that we partner with. And it's, uh, think of it as kind of like a old school semiconductor process, if you will. So we do take the thermoelectric material, bismuth we actually wafer it. Uh, it comes in little ingots and we wafer it. And then we, we, we section it uh, and we dice it. And then we have a pick and place machine that puts them in between the two ceramic plates as a, as a little sandwich, if you will. Um, and then it, depending on the size, um, we'll make different sizes for them. Our customers all have different technical requirements. Some of them have hotter spots than others, so we can actually customize the leg density depending on the, on the heat requirements for our customers. So it's like a lower tech fab, no, exactly. no, no pejorative intended. Exactly. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need a $450 million ASML device. Exactly, like, that's right. Well, this is great innovation. What you're doing is not only great technology innovation and love lasers, not going to lie, but it's just good sustainability direction. This is Perfect. where it needs to go. Yep. Congratulations. Yeah, and thanks absolutely. for coming Thank on you. the Cube. Thanks. Uh, AI leaders, infrastructure leaders program. Yeah, thanks so much. This All is right. a lot of fun. Cool. It's the Cube Studio. I'm Joffrey with Dave Vellante. You're watching the Silicon Valley's inaugural AI infrastructure leaders program, Cube plus NYSE leadership event. We'll be back with another great interview after this short break. <laughs>